You guys sounded really good today. Thank you. Very nice. It's great to sing about that, isn't it? Uh, thank you. All right. I just want to, you can sing about it. You can't talk back to me. Okay, whatever. Thank you. So we're going to be in Luke uh, chapter 24 today, but before we get there, uh, we're going to be in John, and so I'll, I'll, I'll kind of be a little bit everywhere today, but we're just going to talk about the risen Christ today. There's a book uh, written by a woman named Ellen Vaughn entitled The God Who Hung on the Cross, and in this story, she talks about missionaries to Cambodia. In 1999, a man goes into Cambodia to uh, share the gospel, and he goes from village to village in this uh, really remote area of Cambodia. And what he finds is that most people have, you know, cast their lot with Buddhism or spiritism. Uh, very few are open to the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But there was one village that he went to, and he was astounded because they were open to hear the message of Jesus. And so he asked them this question, why are you so responsive when every other place I've gone, they don't want to hear it? And after he said this, this older lady shuffled up to him and she said this, she said, we have been waiting for you for 20 years. Allow me to explain, she said. In the 1970s, when the Khmer Rouge came into Cambodia and they were killing everybody. It was an awful, awful regime. They would go into villages and they would rip them out of their homes and they'd bring them outside the village and they would make them dig their own graves and then they would summarily execute them. And they came to this village and they did just that. They brought all the villagers out, had them dig their own graves. And as they're standing in front of the open graves waiting to be executed, some were crying out to Buddha, Others were crying out to the spirits. But there was one lone voice who was crying out from something she had heard as a child, a story her mother had told her about the God who hung on a cross. And she began to cry out to the God who hung on the cross. If he hung on the cross, then he knew what suffering was. And maybe that God would answer. And her solitary voice slowly turned into a unified voice where all of the villagers were crying out to the God who hung on the cross. And as they turned to face their executioners, they were gone. They weren't there. It changed their whole perspective and she said, we've been waiting for 20 years for somebody to come in and to tell us the rest of the story about the God who hung on the cross. <laughs> and he took the time to tell them about the God, Jesus Christ, who hung on the cross but didn't stay there, didn't stay in the grave. He rose again. So allow me, if you would, to tell you the rest of the story about Jesus. Oh, he did die. He did bleed. He did suffer. And if the story ended there, we would be, like Cod said, absolute fools for gathering here this morning. But the story doesn't end there. It goes beyond. John, I think, tells it best. I love how he tells the resurrection story when early in the morning before the sun rose, Mary Magdalene is making her way to the grave, trying to honor her dead savior. Jesus had cast demons out of Mary Magdalene. She became a follower of his. She gets to the tomb and what does she find? But the stone had been rolled away. She was too scared to look in. She just ran back to the disciples and said, somebody stole his body. He's not there. And so what happens? Peter and John start taking off for the tomb. And John, who wrote the Gospel of John, really wants to let us know that he was the faster of the two. He made it to the tomb first. And he got there and he glanced in to the tomb. And what he saw really was what would look like a cocoon. When Jesus resurrected, he resurrected through the death clothes. 
And it would have been like a, a mummy's cocoon. It would have been hardened by then, and it would have looked like his body was still there. So he just walked out. Oh, he's still there. And then Peter comes, huffing and puffing. He's finally made it. He just goes right into the tomb, because that's what Peter does, right? And he's in the tomb looking, and he's thinking, what, what am I seeing here? And he's theorizing about everything. And finally, John has gained courage enough to come in, and he comes into the tomb, and he looks, and he believes. I can just see him elbowing Peter, saying, Peter, he's alive. He told us, and he's alive. And they rejoiced, and it was great, and they left, and they totally forgot about Mary Magdalene, just kind of left her weeping outside of the grave. And she goes in and she looks and she sees angels sitting at the feet of what was the body of Jesus. What have you done with the body? She still is so grief stricken. She goes out and somebody speaks to her outside of the grave and she doesn't recognize him and she thought he was the gardener and she said, please, if you've taken his body, tell me where it is so I can go and anoint it. And it was Jesus. And what does Jesus do? He just says one word. Mary. <gasps> and she got it. It's Jesus. Her eyes were opened up. And there he was. And she falls at his feet. She wants to hug him. And he's like, get back. I haven't gone to my father yet. There'll be plenty of time for that. But just go and tell my brothers what's happened. And so she does. She goes and she tells the disciples what she had seen. And what's astounding is that Mary isn't the only disciple that's disillusioned that day. Those disciples that heard her, some of them didn't believe her story. Two in particular. And we're going to see this epic tale of two disillusioned disciples making their way back home because Jesus couldn't have risen from the dead. So we'll just wall work our way through this, okay? Luke chapter 24, and this is what it says. That very day, the same day that Mary came back and reported, two of them were, were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. You can sense the disillusionment in them. They're just kind of, oh, man. We're just going to go home. And the jig is up, it's over, he's dead, and our little band is broken up, it's done, it's over. I'm going back to my old life. All hope is gone. I want to go back to where I'm comfortable. In fact, Emmaus literally means warm spring. Don't you want to go there? You just want to go sit in a jacuzzi and relax. And that's what they're thinking. I'm done. I, I, I followed him, and it, it, it didn't turn out the way that I thought it would. And then it goes on, and they were talking with each other <laughs> about all these things that had happened. I mean, they had so much material, right? Years of walking with Jesus and following Jesus and miracles and teaching, and uh, how could it end this way? And while they were talking and discussing together, Jesus drew near and went with them. And this may seem strange to you. Some stranger just starts walking next to you. In our culture, that's a bit odd. Not then. They walked everywhere. So it's no surprise that somebody would just step up and walk with them. And it goes on. But uh, their eyes were kept from recognizing him. I think this is God in his sovereign way just uh, veiling himself from them. And he said to them, what is this conversation that you're holding with each other as you walk? I'm fascinated by what you're talking about. So get the picture. They're just walking along. What are you guys talking about? And they're like, what? What else would we be talking about? How do you not know? And, and they go on after they stop dead in their tracks. And one of them said, uh, named Cleopas, answered, are, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who, who doesn't know the things that have happened these days? I'm sorry, guys. I just can't help but think about Sandlot right now. It's like a scene in Sandlot, isn't it? Remember when Hamilton the Babe Porter comes out of the drugstore He's got the baseball because they're going to go play and he's got a 
A bubblegum cigar in his mouth. Remember? If you don't know, I can't believe you have never watched this movie. Go home and watch this movie. <laughs> Comes out, he's got this, and he's like, I'm your great man, Mio. And they're like, what? I'm the great bambino. What? I'm the great bambino. Oh, oh, oh. and Smalls, remember Smalls? Scotty, he's like, who's that? And they're like, what? What did he say? Were you born in a barn, man? Yeah, yeah. What planet are you from? I mean, that's how they respond. You've never heard of the babe, the sultan of swat, the king of crash, the colossus of clout? Oh, the great bambino. You've never heard. Oh, that wimpy deer? Yeah, oh, he got away with it, right? But they didn't know. And they're like that. They're like, this is what it's like. It's like, you haven't heard what's going on in Jerusalem. You're the only one who's never heard. This is a shocking statement because everybody knows what's happened in Jerusalem. And he said, what things? <laughs> what things? And they said to him, concerning Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty indeed, and word before God and all of the people, and how our chief priests, you haven't heard? Our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped, we had hoped he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, Besides all this, it's now the third day since these things have happened. Moreover, some of our women, some of our women of our company, that they amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning. And when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us they went to the tomb and they found it just as the women had said. But they didn't see him. <laughs> These women are delusional. They, they haven't seen what they think they've seen. This is craziness. Dead people don't rise from the dead. But if you really want to understand where they're at, go back to verse 21. This is so telling. But we had hoped but we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, he did redeem Israel. He purchased our salvation. He did what he came to do, but they didn't understand why he came. They thought he was there to set up this government, to rescue them from the hands of their oppressors, to give them power and authority and prestige. That's why James and John were arguing about who's going to sit on the right and who's going to sit on the left because they thought it was an earthly kingdom and it will be one day, just not yet. He came as the Lamb of God the first time. He'll come as the Lion of Judah. He will rule, he will reign, but not yet. Jesus came paramountly to rescue us from our sin. And they saw him wrongly. <laughs> we had so hoped. I, I, I can't get away from that phrase. Last week I came home and my daughter was home and she was watching this show called The Voice. It's kind of like American Idol on steroids. You know, it's a big deal. I've not really watched it, but I sat down and I watched a little bit of The Voice. And it's so dramatic, isn't it? They stand there and there are four judges with their backs turned and if she sings just right, they'll hit their button and turn around and I want you and it's just crazy. But there's always a backstory, right? There's always a backstory. It's some girl who started out as singing in the church choir and my grandma, she said, you're gonna be a star someday. You got what it takes. You're amazing. And then grandma got cancer and she died and Oh, she wanted this for me so bad, and I want this so bad for her. If I can just arrive, I want to be a star. But have you ever asked yourself the question, what if you get 
what you want? What if she got to be a star? What if she won the contest, got a record deal, became famous? What do famous people do? They hide from their fans in their palatial mansions because they can't go out in public anymore and they long for the day when they could just go to Walmart where nobody would know them. It's crazy. You see them sneak through the airport incognito because they don't want what they really wanted. It's amazing. And beyond that, what if it takes you down a path that you don't want to go? Drug abuse, dr drug uh, addiction, pr promiscuity. Who knows where it's going to take you? And you wanted it so bad. But what if you get what you want? What if you do get a Division I scholarship to play football or basketball? Do you realize what that's going to cost you? Are you willing to pay the price that it may cost you your very soul to do it? It's not something that maybe you want. I was talking to a friend of mine a couple weeks ago who's involved in uh, a Division I football program. And, and he's told me, you know, we don't have Sundays. We, we, we don't have any time. Our life is the team. And I think people will die spiritually going after that. What if you get what you want? What if that girl that you're spying out, you want her so bad, that guy that you think you just can't live your life without? What happens when you get what you want and he's an abuser? What then? What happens when you get the job that you want, the career that you've always wanted? Success, power, wealth, prestige what if you get it what if Jesus was who they thought he was just a savior to save the nation for now then Jesus is dead and the kingdom is gone and your soul is lost be careful what you ask for make sure that you see Jesus for who he is because when you see him differently if you see him differently, I promise you this, you will be disappointed in Jesus. If you think that Jesus has come to give you your best life now, you're kidding yourself. It may be the most difficult thing in the world to follow Jesus for the rest of your life, but he will give you the ability to live above your circumstances, even if they never change. But he may not change your world for you. And if you see him that way, when he doesn't, you're going to be disappointed. You'll walk away just like them. Most people, you know what? They don't want Jesus. You know what most people want? They want what Jesus can give them. That's all they want. They don't really want him, just the things that he can give them. I love what C.S. Lewis said. I think he nailed it. He said, I'm trying... I'm trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. <laughs> that is the one thing we must not say. A man who said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level of the man who says he's a poached egg or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon or you can fall at, your, at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. There is an atheist who is now dead, who is more vitriolic in his atheism than probably anybody I have ever seen, certainly in the 21st century. His name was Christopher Hitchens. I would love to watch Hitchens as he debated Christians. He was brilliant. He was very intelligent. And he knew what we believed. He just didn't believe in himself. So he's being interviewed by a woman in Portland, Oregon. 
And she asks them this question. This is so amazing to me. Listen. This woman named Sewell, her last name, says, the religion you cite in your book, by the way, he wrote a book in 2007 called God is Not Great, How Religion Poisons Everything. This is where he's coming from. The religion you cite in your book is generally the fundamental faith of various kinds. I'm a liberal Christian, and I don't take the stories from Scripture literally. I don't believe in the doctrine of atonement, that Jesus died for our sins, for example. Now, do you make any distinction between fundamentalist faith and liberal religion? Listen to Hitchens' response. I would say that if you don't believe that Jesus of Nazareth was the Christ, the Messiah, and that he rose again from the dead, and by his sacrifice our sins are forgiven, you're really in not, not in any meaningful way a Christian. <laughs> He knew what we believed. He believed this woman didn't believe that. If you don't believe that about Jesus, you are not a Christ follower. This is why he came. And Jesus knew that these guys didn't understand. Partially understanding the message is incredibly dangerous. And so he goes on, and I love this. He just rebukes them. He says, oh, foolish ones. And slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. What is it? Wasn't it necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into glory? And then, beginning with Moses and the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Guys, have you not read the Old Testament? That this is exactly who the Christ would be. And what did he do? He, he went back and he told them the story. We've been going through 26 weeks of the story. He did it in seven miles. He's telling them, let me tell you how it all fits together. And I imagine him going back to Genesis and saying, God created us perfectly. We walked with him in the garden. We didn't have sin But it didn't take long, did it, for sin to rear its ugly head and we took a bite and we broke everything by the fall. Cain killed Abel and Noah was the only survivor on a flood because the wickedness just increased and increased and increased. But before they got there, there was a prophecy In Genesis chapter 3, almost right where it began, that it said, one of these days, somebody's coming and he is going to crush the head of the serpent and it will bruise his heel to do it. It's the first prophecy about Jesus that he's coming to take care of death and hell and the devil. One of these days, it's coming. And you go through the whole Old Testament, God choosing Abraham, saying, Abraham, I'm choosing you out of Ur of the Chaldees, and I'm going to make you a great nation. And out of you is Messiah going to come. And you look through the whole Old Testament, how this, this family turns into a tribe that turns into a nation. And from this nation, Messiah would be born. And the whole Old Testament is written with these prophecies about Jesus coming. 350 different prophecies about Messiah coming, fulfilled in Jesus Christ, and they're blind to it. They don't even get it. I mean, can you imagine this conversation as he's walking? Uh, Did you guys read the, the Bible? It was the only thing that existed then. What does it say about Messiah? He said, let me just run through a quick laundry list. I won't even go through everything. Remember, he was gonna be born of a virgin? Oh, yeah. Did he ever say he was? Yeah, he did. Family tree of Abraham? Yep. Line of Jesse? Yep. Tribe of Judah? Oh, yeah. House of David? Uh Uh-huh. Where was he born? Bethlehem. What did the Old Testament say? Born in Bethlehem? Okay. He did miracles? Yes. He was betrayed by a friend for 30 pieces of silver? That was in the Old Testament too? Yeah. Yeah. Forsaken by his friends, accused by false witnesses, hands and feet were pierced. Psalm 22, before crucifixion was ever invented, he's saying, this is what's going to happen to Messiah. Crucified with thieves, rejected by his own people, hated without a cause, his garments would be parted and they'd cast lots for them. 
forsaken by God. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Psalm 22 again, no bones would be broken. Jesus' bones were never broken. They went to break his legs to kill him quicker, but he was already dead, pierced in the side. Darkness fell over the land. He was buried in a rich man's tomb. Is this what happened to Jesus, guys? Uh, yeah. It's all been prophesied. You're missing it. This is who he said he was. Maybe he even read Isaiah 53, that this Messiah would stay dead, that he would rise from the dead. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him, Isaiah said, to cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life. He's coming back to life again. It really happened. You may not have seen him, but it happened. I promise you, it happened. And because he's alive, you have something to look forward to. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, he says, if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you're still in your sins, then those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope, in this life only, we are of all people to be most pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of all who fall asleep. He's not dead, he's alive. And because he's alive, there's so much more to hope for than just your best life now or some great life here. It's forever. It's forgiveness of sins. It's a relationship with the Father. It's no fear of death. It's peace in your heart, and it's an eternal life. W.B. Henson was a preacher from another generation, and he wrote this when he found out he was going to die. He lived in Portland, Oregon. He said, I remember a year ago when a doctor told me, you have an illness from which you won't recover. And I walked out where I live five miles from Portland, Oregon. And I looked across that mountain that I love. I looked at that river in which I rejoice. And I looked at the stately trees that are always God's own poetry to my soul. Then in the evening, I looked up into the great sky where God was lighting his lamps. And I said, I may not see you many more times, but mountain... I shall be alive when you are gone. And river, I shall be alive when you cease running towards the sea. And stars, I shall be alive when you have fallen from your sockets in the great pulling down of the material universe. Oh, that's good stuff. One of these days I'll die, but I will live on forever. Long past mountains and stars and rivers and this earth, and as he's saying this, as he's speaking about the risen Savior, something begins to resonate. And I don't think they said anything, but they're thinking, who is this guy? Is what he's saying true? Could it possibly be? And he goes on, it's so beautiful. This is where a story gets so good. So they drew near, they'd gone seven miles to the village to which, which they were going. And he acted like he was going to just continue on. He's just continuing. Oh, whoa, wait, 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 wait. He, but they urged him strongly, stay, stay with us, for it's towards evening, and, and the day is now far spent. We don't want you to go. You're saying too many good things. Stay with us. And, and he did. I love it. Isn't it great? It doesn't take much for Jesus to stay. You just need to invite him. And they just invite him. And it's wonderful. It's so amazing. And it goes on. It gets better. This is so great. When he was at the table with them, he took bread and he blessed it and he broke it and he gave it to them. This is odd. This isn't his house. He's not the you know, master of ceremonies. He's like, hey, I'm hungry. Are you guys hungry? No, we just want to hear more about what you're saying. Uh, well, I'm hungry. You got any bread? You got anything to eat in this place? Yeah, go here. There's something in the cupboard. And Jesus goes and he gets a piece of bread and he puts it in front of them. 
and he breaks it. Oh, 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 look at this. When he, uh, and, and, and their eyes were opened and they recognized him. And then he vanished from their sight. <laughs> Isn't that a beautiful thing? I mean, get the picture, all right? Here he is, a stranger one moment, giving them the lesson of their life. He breaks bread, and their eyes are opened. What opened their eyes? I, I think it was God's sovereign will that their eyes opened, but I want you to think about this for a minute. He broke the bread, and he served them. What's he exposing? His wrists. And they look at the scars in his wrist, and their eyes were open. And they look at each other like, oh. and Jesus looks at them, and he winks, and he's gone. He disappears. That's amazing. What drama. That is so beautiful. I can imagine this big smile on Jesus' face. I got ya, and I'm gone, and you knew about it. It's so amazing. And they said to themselves when he left, this is so good, they said to each other, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? Didn't you want what he said to be true? Didn't you want to believe it? And now we see it's true. And this is amazing. It's like life was breathed back into them. If you've ever seen the movie Backdraft, you know that that movie is more about fire than it is about the firemen. But do you know what a backdraft is? As I understand it, when all of the oxygen has been sucked out by the fire and there's no fire left and there's no oxygen left but some breach is made in the room whether the door is open or a crack in the window or something and oxygen just pours back into that room reigniting this fire and it makes this massive explosion that's backdraft and that's a terrible thing if you're fighting a fire but it's a beautiful thing if you've lost your faith and it comes back to you because it's true what Jesus said. And they knew it. And so what do they do? They rose up. They'd, they'd walked seven miles. They told Jesus, come in. It's time to go to bed. But they don't go to bed. They rose up at the same hour and they returned to Jerusalem. And they found the 11 and those who were gathered together saying, the Lord is risen indeed. And he appeared to Simon then they told what had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of bread. When he broke the bread, we recognized him. This is an amazing story. It's an amazing story for the fact that it's true. But it's true for you too today. If this is true, guys, that Jesus is alive, then we've got a story to tell, don't we? We have something to speak about. I love the word gospel, evangelion, evangelism. It's the good news. We've talked about this. When two villages would go to war with one another, there would be a banner carrier, and he would go with them, and if they won the battle, he would run back to his village waving the banner, saying, we won, we won. That man became known as the Evangelion, the one who brought good news. You are Evangelions. You're evangelists. You've got a story to tell if this is true. Oh, and some of you are yawning in your hearts because it's not become real to you. You're thinking about what you're gonna eat when you leave. You're thinking about what you've got to do when I am telling you the most important story that's ever been told. There was a great actor, his name was McCready, and he was having dinner with a preacher. And the preacher just asked him this question. He said, I wish you would explain something to me. What is the difference between you and me? You appear before the crowds night after night with, with, with fiction, and the crowds come wherever you go. And I, 
and preaching the essential, unchanging truth, and I'm not getting any crowd at all. What's the difference between you and me? And McCready said, oh, it's easy. It's so easy. You see, I, I have fiction that I preach as if it's fact. And you have fact, and you preach it like it's fiction. You don't even believe the message that you preach. Do you believe it? Do you believe this to be true? If so, then you've got a story to tell. We have a story to tell. Let me close with just this little illustration. There's a lady, her name is Edith. Edith Burns. And if you would have known Edith, you would find that she was a walking evangelist. Even in the doctor's office, she would have a big black Bible on her lap and she would wait for the opportunity for some young mother to come in and she would always introduce herself by saying, hello, my name is Edith Burns. Do you believe in Easter? That's how she opened her conversations. And the doctor would hear her and he loved Edith. But that particular day, the doctor had very bad news. And he brought Edith into his uh, office. And he said to her, uh, Edith, your lab reports came back and, and it says you have cancer. And you're not going to live very long. There's really nothing we can do about it. And Edith said, why, Dr. Phillips, shame on you. Oh, my microphone's going out. The devil doesn't want me to say this. <laughs> Pray that it stops. Um, why, Dr. Phillips, shame on you. Why are you so sad? Do you think God makes mistakes? You've just told me, I'm going to see my precious Lord Jesus, my husband, my friends. You've just told me that I'm going to celebrate Easter forever. And here you are, having difficulty giving me my ticket. Well, it didn't take long for the cancer to really ravage her body. She was brought to the hospital. She even asked the doctor before she was brought, she said, would you make sure that there are people that are in my room that need to hear about Jesus? And sure enough, those people were there. And Edith would introduce herself that way. And she would explain the gospel. Edith was such a massive impact in that ward that they started to call her Edith Easter. <laughs> because that's what she would ask. And everybody loved Edith, except for one person. Her name was Phyllis. Phyllis Cross. She was the head nurse. She was an old school nurse. She'd been in the army. She was like the original G.I. Jane. She'd seen it all. She'd heard it all and then some. She was cold and hard. Get everything by the book. And Phyllis Cross refused to attend to Edith because she considered her to be a religious nut. Well, one day one of her nurses was sick and so she had to go in and deal with Edith. She walked in and Edith looks at her and says, Phyllis, God loves you and I love you too. And Phyllis, I'm praying for you. And Phyllis said, well, you can quit praying for me because it won't work. I'm not interested and Edith said, well then, I guess I'll pray and ask God not to take me home until you're finally in His family. And she said, then you'll never die because it'll never happen. And she walked out of the room. And every day Phyllis would, would walk into that room and Edith would say, God loves you, Phyllis, and I love you too, and I'm praying for you. Well, one day Phyllis said, I just got this incredible sense that it was drawn to Edith's room like a magnet would draw iron. And she went into Edith's and she sat on her bed and Edith said, I am so glad you've come because God told me that today is your day. And Edith said, 
or Phyllis said, Edith, you've asked everybody here this question. Do you believe in Easter? But you've never asked me. And Edith said, Phyllis, I wanted to many times, but I sensed I needed to wait until you asked. And now that you have, she took her Bible and she explained the story of Easter. And then she asked, Phyllis, do you believe in Easter? Do you believe that Jesus Christ is alive and He wants to live in your heart? And Phyllis said, I want to believe that with all my heart. And I do want Jesus in my life. And right there, Phyllis prayed and invited Jesus Christ to be her Savior, to forgive her sins, to make her a new person. And she didn't walk out of that hospital room. She was carried on the wings of angels. And two days later, Phyllis came in and Edith said, do you know what day it is? And Phyllis said, why, Edith, it's Good Friday. And Edith said, oh no, for you, every day is Easter. Happy Easter, Philip, Phyllis. Well, two days later, Phyllis went and brought some lilies into Edith's room. And she saw Edith was lying on her back and a, and, a, and a Bible was there on her chest. Her hands were inside of the Bible. And she went to move her hands and she saw that Edith had died. And there were two passages of Scripture that she had her hand on. The first one was John 14. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it weren't so, I would tell you, I go to prepare a place for you so that where I am, there you will be also. And I will come and receive you unto my own. And the other hand was on Revelation chapter 21, verse 4. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes and there shall be no more death, no more sorrow or crying, and there shall be no more pain for the former things have passed away. <laughs> And Phyllis took one look at those verses and looked up and she said, Happy Easter, Edith! Happy Easter, Edith! And she walked out of the room. And she walked down the hallway and there were two nursing students who were sitting at a table. And she walked up to them and she said, My name is Phyllis Cross. Do you believe in Easter? <laughs> she finished what she'd started. Because God had done a work in her life. So if I might be so bold as to ask you, do you believe in Easter? Have you trusted in Jesus Christ as your Savior? You know, He loves you. And he died for you. And he rose again. If not, would you today? And if you have, would you open your mouth for goodness sakes? Would you testify to this? Would you be an evangelion? We're going to have a baptism in just a second, and I want to tell you something. But Miranda is a little girl who's going to be baptized in just a couple of minutes, and she's probably nervous as can be. But she doesn't have to be because we're all cheering for her, right? And we're excited that she is. But Miranda is going to stand before you and testify that Jesus Christ is her Savior. And she's going to do something a little bit odd. She's going to be completely dry and come up here and get completely wet. And we're going to dunk her and we're going to raise her. It's a symbol of the death of Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus. That's the picture she's painting for you this morning. If you've never been baptized, we want to invite you to do it. I know, it's weird, isn't it? You guys came with all these nice clothes on. We want you to be baptized. If you've never trusted in Jesus and you've trusted Him, then come forward after you see Miranda being baptized. And we'll baptize you. we got shorts, we got sweatshirts, we got towels. You're good to go. We didn't bring underwear, but you can deal with that later, okay? <laughs> but I want you to know that if you know Jesus and you follow Him in this way, there's something, there's something supernatural to it. I want to read for you uh, a quote by my hero, Charles Spurgeon. He was 15 years old when he was baptized, right after he accepted Christ. And this is what he says about his baptism. He said, It was a new experience to me, never having even seen baptism before. And I was afraid of making some mistake. 
And the wind blew down that river. By the way, he was baptized in the winter in a river. All right? So suck it up, buttercups. It's not bad. That's really, really warm. Okay? It's like bath water. My goodness, we're not asking you to suffer at all. The wind blew down the river with a cutting blast as my turn came to wade into the flood. But after I had walked a few steps and noted the people on the ferry boat and in boats and on either shore, I felt as if heaven and earth and hell might all gaze upon me, for I was not ashamed. There and then, to own myself a follower of the Lamb, my timidity was washed away. It floated down the river into the sea and must have been devoured by the fishes. For I have never felt anything of the kind since. Now listen to this. This is so good. Baptism also loosed my tongue. And from that day, it has never been quiet. I lost thousands of fears in the river that day. And Charles Spurgeon became known as the Prince of Preachers. And I think a good deal of that had to do with his obedience in following Jesus in baptism. So if you believe the story we've talked about, then if you've been baptized and you're doing, that's great. If not, I dare you to step on in faith. Do something uncomfortable today. All right? So here's how the instructions will go. Uh, We will play Miranda's video and she'll walk up and we'll get in the pool together and we'll baptize her. And if while that's happening... You, you sense that God is saying, you know what? Today's your day. Then would you just get up and come on stage? We had three do it in the early service. 74-year-old woman. Uh, Dave Rubel, who's a police officer. I don't know why that matters, but he came up and he came up to me after the service. He said, Todd, when you said you can come, he said, my heart started beating. I thought I was going to have a heart attack. So whatever you're feeling, it's not a heart attack. It's the Spirit of God working on you, okay? (laughs) So if you feel like the Lord is saying, come forward, then just do it, okay? And afterwards, we'll we'll, we'll, we'll go through a couple things. Well, yeah. But um, let's watch this video and um, and, and let's, uh, let's celebrate Miranda. My name is Miranda Rosebrook. I'm nine years old. It was with my grandma in the car before we went to the park and play. She said that, do you want to be saved like by Jesus? Probably say he's the one who was born in a stable. He died on the cross for our sins and he rose from the dead. He helps me get through the hard stuff when I went through hard times. When my parents got divorced, he comforted me. He helps me not be scared. I want to take a step closer to God to share it with the world. My name is Miranda and I have been rescued. See, the water's not too bad, is it? It's a little chilly. I guess it got a little cooler, but it's not too bad. I think you'll be okay. I think you'll be okay. I want you to turn around. I want you to look at these guys, okay? And Miranda, I want to tell you this in front of all these. I told you this before, but, you know, because of your your testimony of baptism in the early service, you, you were the trailblazer for three other people who followed him. And I just want to commend you for that. Way to go. So proud of you. Good job. Do you want to say anything else? No. I didn't think so. <laughs> All right, turn this way, okay. And then I'll have you plug your nose just so you don't, you know, sniff in any kind of water, all right? But Miranda, based on your faith in Jesus Christ, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So anybody else? Here's what, what's going to happen, okay? If, if, if by some chance the Lord is leading you to come, uh, Todd's going to say something in a minute, but I want to just go through, uh, when we talk about baptism, what, what we're talking about. Um, we believe as, 
as Christians that baptism doesn't save you. It does nothing in terms of bringing you to salvation, but it does deepen your walk. But it's a picture. It's a picture of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's a public display of a personal decision. We believe that you have to understand that Jesus died for you and rose again. You repent of your sins. You change your mind about them. And you simply ask him to be your savior. And he will save you. It's a pretty amazing thing. It's a free gift for anybody that would like to. So as you think about that,